morning guys when are we happiest let's think about that question and if we think about it for most of us the answer will be when we love what we do so today conor mcgregor reminds us to love what we do this is the most important thing this is what gives us the drive the energy to be our true great selves and he shares with us his life story he loves fighting of course it's physical fighting for us it doesn't have to be that but he loves it so much that he thinks about it wherever he goes. He carries it with him. To him, he doesn't think that that's unhealthy. He thinks that just living a regular, normal routine like everyone else, going to work 9 to 5, that's unhealthy for him. He wants to pursue his passion, the, things he lo- the thing he loves, and he believes that that is healthy for him. And it's made him feel great. So how can we apply this today in our life? What do you love to do? Have a great morning, everyone. And we have a huge frontal lobe, and it's 40% of our entire brain. And most people, uh, when they have a thought, they just think that that's the truth. And I think one of my greatest realizations in my own journey was just because you have a thought doesn't necessarily mean it's true. So if you think 60 to 70,000 thoughts in one day, and we do, and 90% of those thoughts are the same thoughts as the day before, and you believe that your thoughts have something to do with your destiny, your life's not gonna change very much because the same thought leads to the same choice, the same choice leads to the same behavior, the same behavior creates the same experience and the same experience produces the same emotion. And so then the act of becoming conscious of this process to, to begin to become more aware of how you think, how you act and how you feel, it's called metacognition. And so then why is that important? Because the more conscious you become of those unconscious states of mind and body, the less likely you're gonna go unconscious during the day. And that thought is not gonna slip by your awareness unchecked because you're, it means to know thyself. And the word meditation means to become familiar with. So as you become familiar with the thoughts, the behaviors and the emotions of the old self, you're retiring that old self. As you fire and wire new thoughts and condition the body into a new emotional state, if you do that enough times, it'll begin to become familiar to you. So it's so important, uh, just like a garden. If you're planting a garden, you gotta get rid of the weeds. You gotta take the plants from the past year and you gotta pull them out. The rocks that sift to the top that are like our emotional blocks, they have to be removed. The soil has to be tenderized and broken down. We have to, we have to make room to plant a new garden. So primarily, we learn the most about ourselves and others when we're uncomfortable. Because the moment you move into that uncomfortable state, normally a program jumps in. When that program jumps in, it's because the person doesn't want to be in the present moment and engage it consciously. So when you teach people how to do that with a meditative process, it turns out that when they're in their life, they're less likely to emotionally react. They're less likely to be so rigid and believe the thoughts they were thinking. They're more aware of when they go unconscious back into a habit, and that is what starts the process of change. And so we have to unlearn before we relearn. We have to break the habit of the old self before we reinvent the new self. We have to prune synaptic connections and sprout new connections. We have to unfire and unwire and refire and rewire. We have to unmemorize emotions that are stored in the body, and then recondition the body to a new mind and to a new motion, like deprogram and reprogram. That's the act, and it's a two-step process. The fastest way to change your habits is to change your environment. You ever notice how when you're in a different environment, maybe you go on vacation, maybe you go to an event or seminar, you start doing different things. You are still you and you do some of the things that you used to do, but all of a sudden you're doing new things that become a part of your regular routine. You ever been away for a couple weeks and discover that you built up some new habits and maybe some are healthy, maybe some are unhealthy. (laughs) But if you've ever been away and you notice that you've picked up some new habits, why? Well, it's because the environment demanded it because everybody else was doing it because it was so easy, natural, comfortable to do that, that that's why you do it too. And so if you wanna be able to switch your habits quickly, you change your environments. Now, you may not always be able to go on vacation or go to events or seminars, so those, those are options. But it starts with you figuring out, well, what are 
the habits that you want to develop, who are the people that you want to be around. And when you are around those people, you will start to think differently, which will lead to you behaving differently. When you see other people doing it, you're going to want to do it more. When it's in your environment more, you're going to want to do it more too. This morning I was talking to a, a YouTuber, big YouTuber, bigger than me, more subscribers than me, slightly different niche. And I remember meeting him in California a couple years ago. And one of the things he was struggling with was staying consistent and I'm very consistent. <laughs> and one of the things I was struggling with was staying healthy while I was on the road. And we were having dinner together and he was eating super clean. He was eating fish and salad and I probably had a burger or something, and fries. And coming away from that, what I realized was whoever is more confident wins. And when you're around other people, whoever's more confident in the habit that they have will be the dominant habit that both of you end up picking up. So if we were hanging out together more, here's what would happen. I would become a lot healthier in my eating and he would become a lot more consistent in his content because we'd be inspired by each other because he'd see me working when we make my videos and he'd feel bad that he wasn't making his and he'd have to go and start making his. And I see him eating healthy all the time and be like, man, I should be eating healthy. And it would force me to do it as well that environment switch would allow us to create much better, stronger habits. So now you gotta be careful about the kind of people who you're hanging out with. And if you look at the people who you've got right now around you, chances are they're keeping you stuck, they're keeping you small, they're keeping you where you are. And you're probably pouring into them, right? You're the one giving them love, giving them encouragement, giving them support pouring into them you're you're taking your cup and pouring into them and it's great and it's and you should keep doing that and it's amazing and it's it's fulfilling but who's pouring into you and who's making you get to the next step uh, because if you don't have that you're gonna you're gonna continue to stay small or just have slow growth compared to where you could be so how do we get some practical steps okay that's great what, what do we actually do how do you start making that change happen? Well, the first step is to figure out what is it that you want to get better at? You know, what area of your life or business do you want to be better at? Uh, is it you want to stay more consistent on your habits? You want to you want to learn how to make money? You want to have a better relationship? You want to take care of your health? Like, like what is the thing that you actually want to get better at? Getting clarity on what that thing is. Two is to then surround yourself as much as possible with with content, not even people, because it, it could be great to say, hey, awesome, hang around Joe Dispenza all the time and you will you will become better, you will meditate more, you will solve your problem, awesome, but you don't know Joe Dispenza and he's probably not taking on students right now or mentees, right, or Elon Musk or Oprah Winfrey or whoever, right? You don't know them and so that's not a practical answer, but you can hang around their content. It's why I make these videos every day because if every day there was a new video for you, hopefully it lifts you to bring some of the best experts in the world, the people that I find inspiring and learn from, to share their message. Every morning you don't have that person in your life, but there's videos for you. So step two is, so step one, we're figuring out what is it that we want, right? Where do we want to improve and get better? Step two is who are the people who are, who are living it, who are preaching it, who are living it, who actually inspire you. And there's so many different people out there who are doing it. And Everybody has their own way. I like to say that, you know, uh, an Eric Thomas is gonna yell at you through it and Oprah Winfrey is gonna hug you through it, but they have very similar messages. Whoever style you connect with the most, have that more consistently in your environment. Follow them on Instagram, subscribe to them on YouTube, put their quotes on the wall around you, create your own environment of the people who make you feel like you wanna do more, who inspire you to step out of your comfort zone and take on those new habits that you want to actually adopt, right? So you're creating a new environment for yourself without having to go live with Joe Dispenza or Elon Musk or Oprah Winfrey. Okay, so I call them aspirational mentors and, and it, that can be fundamental and that's where most people need to start because you have access to their books and their videos and their content. You have that access right now and that can make a big shift in you if you start surrounding yourself with it every day. And then step three is to, is to get more in-person connections. And this is more time consuming and more challenging and harder to find the right fits, but can make a big shift as well in your life. So I don't want to only rely on it. That's why step two is actually having just content that you're learning from. But step three, if there's people that you're learning from, do they have an event? Do they have something coming up? Can you hang around people who are like-minded, who are also taking on challenges? I'm doing a challenge right now inside my Mover Makers program where 
movement makers is for thought leaders who are trying to get to the next level with their content and, and break through and have a greater message and reach more people. But a lot of people haven't been as consistent as they should have um, because they're the only ones doing this. They don't know anybody else making content. Their family thinks they're crazy. Like, why are you making another video? They're not seeing results. They don't have a peer group. They don't have anybody to connect with and talk to. And this can relate to any goal that you have. The movement makers is just for kind of thought leaders making content, but whatever goal that you have, if you're the only one that you know who's doing it, it's really hard to stay consistent on it. So our movement makers challenge is every month we have a challenge where you have to make a lead magnet for your business, a solo video, and then three collaboration videos with other people in the group. So it forces you to start making content. And for a lot of the members, this is the most consistent they've ever been now in making content because one, they're doing it together. You feel like you're doing it with other people, even though a lot of the content that you make um, outside will still be separate from the, the members. You're not doing a business together, but it feels like they're connected. We're taking on this challenge together. And then in the collaboration videos, you're, you're, you're connecting with people. You're doing interviews with people. You're, you're sharing your thoughts and feedback. It's not just you talking to a camera in the car with your dogs by yourself anymore. <laughs> and that really, 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 really matters. It really matters. So getting some kind of support group, connecting with other people who are on the same journey, going to seminars or events, uh, of, of humans that you can talk to and connect with who are doing the thing that you want to do. Because the more that you're around those people, the more you're going to stay consistent on the habits that you want to build. So using that three-step process can absolutely change your life. It's it's entirely possible. And if you're watching videos like this, you're, you're already on the growth mindset journey, right? You're already into personal development. You already know you want to do more and serve more and help more. And this helps you elevate yourself to the next level because you are probably the most ambitious person that you know, that you're hanging out with. And, and that's a great place to be because you're serving and helping, but it also sucks because it limits your growth of what you could become. Where if you can, one, clearly identify what do you want to change? What is the habit that you want to take on? Where are you not satisfied anymore in your life? Not beating yourself up and saying you suck, but like the next level of growth that you want to accomplish for yourself. And then two, following people just through content, who are living that message, who are who are not just speaking it, but living it, who, who when you watch their, their videos, you actually get inspired to go make a change in your life. Who are those people? Subscribe to them, follow them every day, watch their content, read their books, put their stuff up on your wall. As a reminder, you're creating a new environment for yourself. And then three is actually connecting with humans, joining a group like Mover Makers or something else, going to events where your your tribe is at so that you are not alone doing this journey, feeling isolated and like you don't belong. Make those three changes. It will change your life. The difference between where you are now, where you could be, it's just the consistent habits that you're putting in. You know this. I know you know this. <laughs> now it's about taking the actual action to stay consistent on those habits. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there. Good afternoon, guys. How's it going so far? Have you done one thing that you love doing today? Um, if you haven't, if uh, your day is still not one where you found something you love to do, think about what it is that you really don't love doing. So if you're in a moment right now where you are absolutely miserable, you're not happy doing what you're doing, maybe you're in a job, you're just doing it just to get by, pay the bills, start thinking about how the intensity of that feeling can be turned around. How can you start thinking about what the opposite of that is? What is the thing that you that will make you happy, will make you feel fulfilled? What is that thing that you love doing? And start thinking about opportunities wherever you are today where you can look and maybe find 
a chance to even put that thinking into practice. The day's not over. Believe in yourself. Never give up on finding what you love to do. And it could be right uh, beside you right now. Have a great afternoon, everyone. The one thing you need if you want to move higher is a greater awareness. People are not earning a hundred thousand a year because they want to earn a hundred thousand a year. They're earning a hundred thousand a year because they're not aware of how to earn a hundred thousand a month. People aren't alone and lonely because they enjoy being alone and lonely. They're alone and lonely because they're not aware of how to build meaningful relationships. People don't struggle all of their commercial career because they enjoy struggling. They're struggling because they're not aware of how to knock those blocks down that are all inside. It's never outside. It's never another person. It's never a condition or a circumstance. It's always lack of awareness. This is such beautiful information. I've been living with it for a long time. I don't even know how you'd live without it. In fact, I don't think you can. You merely exist. And unfortunately, that's the way most people go through life. You see, our educational institutions is not giving us this same kind of information. They really don't. They really believe the secret is read the book, remember what's in the book, and be able to repeat it. Answer the questions more right than wrong. You'll pass, you get the degree. Well, we've got people graduating from some of the most prestigious universities in the world every year with multiple degrees that are having difficulty finding work, that are broke. How does that happen? And yet you'll find other people who are functionally illiterate, they can neither read nor write, that are earning millions. How do we account for this? You're gonna find that out as you study this. It's got nothing to do with anything outside of ourself. Education isn't answering what's in the book. Education comes from the Latin educo, meaning to reduce, to develop, or to draw from within. Remember I said, Everything's already here, omnipresent. That's within us. Madame Montessori was right. Napoleon Hill was right. Carnegie knew the right question. Hill knew how to answer it. What are you gonna do with the rest of your life? That's your question. You gotta make a decision. Need motivation? Watch the top 10 with Believe Nation. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael and I make these videos because you are probably the most ambitious person in your circle, but you know you're capable of more and you get that push by surrounding yourself with the best. So today let's learn from one of the best, Bob Proctor and my take on his top 10 rules of success. Enjoy. Rule number two, desire to grow. What's the thing? You want to learn and understand that you feel like you know what i haven't fully grasped this concept or idea oh, wow. and i really want to get to another level well i'm always wanting to get to another level hopefully i'm at a higher level today than i was yesterday i uh, i'm in here around 5 30 every morning studying wow. uh, that's how i start my day here well you see there is no end to the growth you you always want to grow so you're created in God's image. Now, there's a problem with this. Because we're raised on our physical senses, we grow up and what we've done is had God created in our image, in our mind. Not that we're creating God's image. We're taught that we created God in our image. Mm. So now we're trying to figure out how can the man be omnipresent? How can that person be everywhere? And because we're locked in on a physical level, we get lost. When we understand that you have infinite potential, there is no top. There's no beginning, no end. See, when it comes to school of greatness, there is no finish line. Mm -hmm. When it comes to personal development, there is no finish line. So how can you tell how well you're doing? By the results you're getting. By their fruits. By their fruits, you'll know them. By the results they're getting. <clears throat> if they're not getting the results, they don't know. So if you're going to get a mentor, 
get somebody that's getting the results. Yeah. Or you don't want them. Rule number three, put money to use. You see here on page six, it says money is a servant. It's a servant. Now, there's a myth about money. It says another myth about money, like you accept money, is that it only comes as a result of luck or good fortune. Well, of course, that is really silly. That's not true at all. But that's the concept that a lot of people operate with. Okay? Now, if you move over onto page seven, we're talking about money's got to circulate. It's not only a servant, you've got to keep it moving. I have some money here in my pocket. I keep it in a little envelope. And uh, this stuff here is money. The truth is, this represents money. Now, this used to be paper. Now I think it's plastic. You know, use it as a fan. But this is, it, it's a servant. And you can put this to work. You got to keep it circulating. Now we tell a story in here about um, uh, Mr. Chapman. Now Mr. Chapman was an interesting guy. He lived on the street that I lived on as a little boy. And my brother and I had a paper route and we sold papers to the people on that street. We had 300 customers, went right from Kingston Road to the Lake Ontario. And almost every house we had as a customer. Mr. Chapman had a big house, not too far from our house, up on a hill. It was an old house. And one day, Mr. Chapman, we used to feel sorry for him. He was, he was hunchback. He was a little man. He used to push a little cart around, and he collected junk. His wife was a, a tall, thin lady, and uh, she always wore just skimpy clothes, like a, a, a cotton dress with a, maybe a little coat, running shoes. And she would be off up the street. She went to clean houses or clean offices. They, we thought they were really poor. Well, one day we opened the paper. We went up the corner to get the papers. And when we got the delivery of the papers, it was headlines that Mr. Chapman had died. It was a headline in the Toronto Star. They found $100,000, $100,000 in a jar in the house. Here he is collecting junk. And he had $100,000 in a jar in the house. Now, I just looked up that, that up this morning. That's equal to $1,087,798 in today's dollars. That's what $100,000 in 1947 would have been. Uh, in today's dollars, it would be over a million, a million eighty-seven, eighty-eight thousand. He had all this money, and he had it in a jar. It was serving no one. It wasn't circulating. We were shocked that he even had it. So what we've got to understand is that saving it like that is silly. Like here, the money that's in this envelope in my pocket, it's useless as long as it's in an envelope in my pocket. It does no one any good. You may be saying, why are you keeping it there? It won't stay, in, <laughs> it won't stay there very long. I'll have it circulating in a very short period of time. Now, if you come down to the bottom of page nine, these are just basics. We're talking about here about a prosperity consciousness exercise. Now that we have touched upon some of the characteristics of money, let us turn briefly to a simple technique which you can begin using immediately to start attracting the amount of money that you desire. Now think of that. You can literally attract to you the amount of money you desire. You've got to ask yourself, where do I stand with money? Rule number four, stop worrying. First of all, the cause of fear is ignorance. That is the cause of fear. And so if you follow the ignorance, it doesn't start out as fear. The ignorance starts out in a conscious level as doubt and worry. Mm -hmm. That's on a conscious level. We're doubting or we're worrying then we take whatever image comes into our consciousness of the doubt and the worry, and we turn it over to our emotional mind, that's what causes the fear. Well, that fear then has to be expressed through the body, through the only instrument it can be expressed through, our physical body. It sets up a vibration known as anxiety. Mm -hmm. Anxiety is not expressed. Anxiety becomes suppressed. Ooh. We suppress it. And the suppression then turns to depression. 
which turns to disease, which turns to decay. You see, you're talking about a track a person gets on. It's a very negative track. It's ignorance, don't worry, fear, anxiety, suppression, depression, disease, disintegration. Now, the polar opposite of all that, the opposite of ignorance is knowledge. Mm. There's only one way to get to knowledge, and that is to study. Mm. Now, unfortunately, uh, school didn't do the job that it was designed to do for most of us. Mm -hmm. School should teach us to love to study. Mm. That's not, really to, what not, to, not to dread studying and homework no. and tests. <laughs> they should teach us to love it. Yeah. Because study yeah. leads to the opposite of don't worry, which is understanding. See, it's study that leads to understanding. We understand how to handle the fear. Mm -hmm. It's understanding that enables us to cause us to understand where the fear starts. The understanding, then, we want to say, what do we understand? We want to understand this whole universe operates by law. Mm -hmm. One of the laws is the law of opposite. The opposite of don't worry is understanding. Mm. Now, if the don't worry leads to fear, what's understanding leads to? Understanding leads to faith. The faith leads to expression, well-being and expression. It's not depression. Mm. It's not suppression. It's not anxiety. The faith leads to well-being. The well-being then is expression, acceleration, because we're at ease. We're not at, there's not disease. So you're dealing with polar opposites. There's two yeah. different sides to things. And when we understand that, our world starts to change. It's by understanding that that we learn how to deal with these pandemics when they hit. Mm -hmm. And they will hit. There will be others. There always has been, all down through history, if you look back. There's been things like this happen in the past. And unfortunately, the masses are sort of paralyzed by it. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there. Rule number five, adopt good habits. It said no amount of reading or memorizing is going to make you successful. It's the understanding and application of why something happens. You can just study this. I study it every day, every day, for at least an hour, sometimes more, but at least an hour. It's a habit. Habit's something you do unconsciously. You don't even spend any time thinking about it. You just do it. You get dressed by habit. You shower, comb, wash your hair. Habit. Do you know good habits automatically transform our life? Rule number six, discover who you are. The purpose of a goal is not to get, it's not to reach the goal, it's the awareness that you develop as you go after it. You're learning who you are. It's becoming aware of who you are. Yeah. I was in a seminar years and years ago, and um, there was a speaker, Bill Gove. Bill Gove was considered the Frank Sinatra of public speakers. He was incredible. He had a handheld mic, and he's looking at the audience, and he said, if I want to be free, I've got to be me. Hmm. Not the me I think you think I should be. Not the me I think my kids think I should be. Not the me I think my wife thinks I should be. If I want to be free, I've got to be me. Hmm. He said, I better know who me is. Rule number seven, plant your idea. So you're building an idea and you're planting it in universal intelligence. 
Now, when you do that, when you do that, what you want to understand is that you planted that idea here. That idea then is planted in universal intelligence, so it's drawing from anywhere, anything that's in harmony with it. You see, this is a vibration. It's a frequency. And we have put ourselves on a specific frequency. When you hold that idea, when you're emotionally involved, that must be expressed with and through you. Whatever you need is in the universe, and this idea is gonna attract it to you. Because the idea controls the vibration that you're in, the vibration you're in controls what you, how you act, but it also controls what you attract. This is very important you get this. Your subconscious mind is, um, is like universal intelligence. And that idea then um, is on a specific frequency. Hold on. We're spiritual beings. This is the spiritual side of you. Now, everything's spirit. The intellect and the physical. But when you plant the idea here, it's planted on a specific frequency. It's almost like when I phone somebody, what I'm doing is I'm tuning in on a particular frequency. And they're on that frequency. And when I press a number, their phone rings. Doesn't matter where they are. They could be anywhere in the world. You see, when it comes to universal intelligence, you eliminate all time and space. There's no such thing as time and space. Everything's in the now. Everything is in the now. And it's important that we understand that. And when we understand it, good things start to happen to us. Okay? Now, that idea will attract to it anything that's in harmony with it. So whatever you need will come to you but it won't come to you before you need it. And we're very impatient and we want to do this part before we get this part done. You got to do things in the order. You see, this part is operating by law. It's operating by law because it's universal intelligence and the law is perpetual transmutation of energy. That idea instantly begins to move into form and it attracts whatever is required but it also causes you to act the way you have to act. So it's the action and attraction that ultimately produces the result. How long does it take for that to manifest? We don't know. That's governed by a law called law of gender. That law decrees that all things have a gestation or an incubation period. Rule number eight, don't think in reverse. I want you to stop and think of something you really want that may be the thoughts on your mind frequently that you really can't get. Now, let's clearly understand this is what I've got on the screen here is what we do far too often. Far too often. We let the bank balance control our head. Now, I never let that happen. Do you know why? I never look at the balance. I've never balanced a checkbook in my life. I've never, and I don't intend to ever do it. I don't want to do it. I think it's terrible work. I don't want to do it. Now, does somebody have to do it? Absolutely. And I've got people working with me. They're, Sandy Gallagher is a genius at this. She's just absolute genius. And so I like her being able to do what she's a genius at. I don't want to do it. I don't want to let results control my thinking. I prefer to do this. Now, look here. I'm going to take this, and this is what I suggest you do, and rub this out. Rub present results out. And then start thinking here. We know that there's a power that's flowing into our consciousness. We know that. And this power, as it flows in, it just is. It's neither positive or negative. It just is. 
and we can make out of it anything we want. I've got the idea here. I'm not telling you what it is. I'm going to show you what it is. Mikey and I are going to discuss it some more. We get this idea here. Now, she's going to take this to the marketing team, and they're going to be start talking about it. Now, let's understand this. You can do what I'm suggesting here. And when you do this, you then become, this, this is you here, you become like you're magnetized. And, 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 and you just, it's like, whatever idea you hold, you impress upon your subjective mind, this is the part that you've got to try and get straight. This part here, okay? Your subconscious mind is part of everything. Everything's hooked together. Remember I say the love is a vibration. There's no line of demarcation. They're all joined together. Each one is hooked up to the one above and the one below. That's everything in the universe is connected like that. Now, and you can change it. You have the creative ability to change it. You see this here? Here's a, an hourglass. The sand in the glass is running here. It never stops. The glass that's holding the sand used to be sand. Now think what I'm saying. The glass that's holding the sand used to be sand. But we have learned how to alter the molecular structure, change the vibratory rate of the energy that we call sand, then we can turn it into glass, then we can mold it whatever way we want, and we can make an hourglass out of it. It's energy. The energy that we call that is glass, we call this sand because of the vibration it's in, we call this wood because of the vibration it's in. Okay, we call this skin, we call this hair, we call this cloth. It's all energy and it vibrates. Everything is hooked together because every frequency is connected to the one above and the one below. When you get emotionally involved with an idea and you really get it to sink into your consciousness, you move your body into a vibration, but the mind body is in the vibration and you are in sync intellectually, emotionally, and physically. The consciousness and the subconscious and the body own the same vibration. You have an, a, strong, a strong attractive force set up. And that attra strong attractive force is gonna start attracting to you from every side of the universe. Whatever is necessary to manifest that idea in physical form or in results. That is the result you want to see, not the, not the one that exists now. When you look at the present result, that's thinking in reverse, and that's what this night chapter nine is about. Most people think in reverse. Do not think in reverse. Quit looking backwards. It's a waste of time and a waste of energy, and it's very destructive for your own future. Rule number nine, be willing to do it. The only criteria you have to have when you set a goal is do you want it? Do you want it? Doesn't matter how you're gonna do it. It doesn't matter where the money's coming from. I once heard a cute story where the Maharishi, when he was taking transcendental meditation or decided he was gonna take it to the world, one of his close associates said, where's the money gonna come from? He said, wherever it is right now. I always thought it was such a beautiful answer because the truth, everything you need, everything you want is already here. Nothing is created or destroyed. I didn't dream this up. It's the way it is. All science, all theology tell us that. The way to get the moon was already here, always here. When President John Kennedy asked Dr. Werner von Braun, who's considered the, the father of the space travel, what it would take to build a rocket that would carry a man to the moon and bring him back safely to Earth. Von Braun answered him in five words, the will to do it. The will to do it. Will is a mental faculty that gives us the ability to concentrate. You gotta concentrate on what you want. That's all you can concentrate on. And that will keep you on the frequency that you have to be on to attract everything that you need to get there. This is so important. You see, I believe decision where it all starts. It's where it all started for Napoleon Hill. It all started when Carnegie asked him, are you prepared 
to dedicate the rest of your life to an idea for which you'll probably receive no material compensation for at least 20 years. How would you answer that? You see, he didn't know how to do that. He didn't even believe he could. Do you know what I found? When you set a goal, you don't have to believe it. If you keep repeating it, you'll come to believe it. If you tell yourself a lie often enough, you'll believe it. Way back in 1900, William James from Harvard, he said, believe, and your belief will create the fact. So true, so true, and so misunderstood. So what do you want? Compare your dream to Napoleon Hill's idea. Just compare it for a moment. Your idea is probably small by comparison, but if you don't know how to do it, if you don't know where the money's coming from, if you don't know where the help's gonna come from, it'll probably seem large. When I took my pen and I sat down and I wrote, I would build a company that operated all over the world. I had no idea how I was gonna do it. I certainly didn't have the finances to it. I didn't have the help. I didn't even have an assistant. I was just me in my den writing on a pad. Do you know something? Today, I own a company, along with Sandy Gallagher, who is my business partner, and we operate all over the world. These aren't accidents. I'm just an ordinary guy that's doing what the public would consider something extraordinary. But it's not extraordinary to me, and it's not going to be to you when you start to understand these principles and incorporate them into your life. I mentioned we want to build schools in Africa for kids that have never seen a school. And so we're building them. There's many things we want to do. We do them all. I never wonder if I can do something. I just ask myself, do I want to? That's the way I think God meant us to live. I believe we're doing God's work. Somebody said, what's God's work? God, well, if God's the creator, then God's work would be creation. We've been given the mental faculties to create. We've been created in God's image. Somewhere along the line, way back when, somebody got that mixed up. They thought when they said you're creating God's image that God was created in their image that are looking for a man on a cloud. There is no man on a cloud. But I'm gonna tell you something. You got some phenomenal stuff locked up inside of you. You bring it to the surface, you can have anything you want. It's a great way to live. And rule number 10, the last one before some very special bonus clips is have fun. The world is mine, it can be yours, my friend, whenever you pretend. Pretend you're happy when you're blue, it isn't very hard to do. And you'll find happiness without an end, whenever you pretend. Good evening guys how did it go today was there a time where you were so in love with what you were doing that you totally lost track of time well hopefully there was if but if there wasn't i want you to continue to visualize and think about what it is you love doing and try to think about opportunities in the future where you can apply this now i want to share with you my personal uh, life story just briefly for me when I'm involved in reading, writing, thinking about anything related to positive thought energy, things that lift me up, that make remind me of what it means to be human and our unlimited potential, that's when I feel most alive. And when I do that, I lose track of time. And that's how I know that's my purpose. That's my drive. That's my energy. And I just want to remind you, never give up on finding what it is you love and pursuing it. Have a great evening, everyone. The hardest part about failing that people battle with is not necessarily the failure, it's the emotion attached to the failure. Because we, we come from, you know, human beings are uh, social creatures. So that's why you live with your family. You don't live alone. 
That's why you live in a society and a community. That's why you go to a church. That's why you go to an office. And everywhere you go, when you get there, there are other human beings. Human beings are social creatures. And a part of being a social creature is, it is feedback. So you have the friends you have because you like the feedback. When you make a joke, they laugh. Um, you, you go to the places you go to because you like the feedback. So as human beings, we're in a constant system of feedback. When you went to school, at the end of a term, you wrote a test or an exam for feedback. The hardest part about failing is you don't like the feedback because, because you don't know if you failed or if the business failed because you are the business, you're the entrepreneur. And so you, you have to deal with these emotions attached to failure. And then what happens is you start questioning yourself. You start asking questions like, am I really as good as I think I am? Like, am I really this good? Or has it just been my ego this whole time? And then you go back to the time when there was a guy in high school who told you you'd, be a, you'd, you'd amount to nothing. Or an ex-girlfriend or ex-boyfriend who told you that you would amount to nothing. And you go, maybe they were right. You know, what's funny about human beings is if you wrote a test and you got 70%, your mind doesn't see the, the answers you got right. When you go through the exam paper after you get it back from your teacher, you look for the answers you got wrong. Because that's how we're wired as human beings. So if you have had a hundred people tell you you're amazing and three people tell you you are useless, you will always remember the three people. What I call, it's, it's what's called the imposter syndrome. So your internal dialogue starts being framed by negative perceptions of self, by self, based on the perceptions of others. Hmm. So the, the real problem with failure is because it, it supports the three people who told you you were worth nothing, not the 97 who told you you're amazing. So for me, that was like the hardest part, right? Like the hardest part was going, the hardest part was having to understand that I was not that failure, that the failure didn't define me, that it was, it was a moment, you know, it was, it happened and, um, you know, and I needed to move on from it. Um, and that failing doesn't make you any less of what you were. You're still great, you're still amazing, you're still smart and intelligent and hardworking, you're still all of those things, all of those things about you are true. The event does not define you. It's just an event. You're an athlete that showed up to run a 100 meter race and had a bad race. Doesn't mean you're a bad athlete. You had a bad race. Need motivation? Watch a top 10 with Believe Nation. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael and I make these videos because you are probably the most ambitious person in your circle, but you know you're capable of more and you get that push by surrounding yourself with the best. So today let's learn from one of the best, Vusi Tembequeo, and my take on his top 10 rules of success. Enjoy. Rule number two, be prepared to walk alone. I grew up, I grew up without, I suffered, I was told I'm worthless. Now that I have it, I'm gonna show everybody. Because if they affirm to me that I am, then I must be. And it's not until you get to a stage where you realize the affirmation is not necessary, that you're truly free. So as you build your business, I'm telling you now that if it's the external affirmation you're looking for, you're gonna sickle. You're not gonna get it, guys. It's hard, like, and it's, it's not unless you walk the journey, right? It's when you are in it that you're like, why don't they get it? Yeah, the world must be, they're losing their minds. Have you ever seen something that nobody else sees, but you know it's there, because you can see it. You're like, nah, and you explain it, but they don't see it, right? And in that, the only thing that keeps you sane is if the only affirmation you need is you. So it's kind of counterintuitive, right? Quickly, before we start, I've got to tell you this. I'll tell you why it's counterintuitive. Um, anthropologists and human science specialists both have studied prisons. Prisons are a fascinating thing, right? Because when you're a human being, what we do in this thing called a society, very careful of society, by the way, because society is nothing more than a system of normalized averages. So, so, so what it is, is we all come together and we go, well, for us, for there to be order, 
in any system that can grow exponentially, ergo population growth, we need a system to manage it. And we're gonna codify the system and we're gonna call these things good behavior, etiquette, rules, laws. If you break them, we're gonna punish you. We have to do it, otherwise there'll be disorder. Like if nobody tells you, sit on the right-hand side of the car and drive on the left-hand side of the road. You're gonna sit wherever you want, you're gonna drive however you want. And we can't create a society like that. So what society does is it writes these rules, it codifies them, that create the average for the average. The average human being should be like this. That's why your mom says, go to school, get a good education, get a job, get a husband, have two and a half kids, live in the White House with a picket fence. That's why you're told that, because your mother comes from a society with a system of normalized averages. And then you come up and go, no, nah, maybe not. Maybe I don't want to finish school. Or maybe I do, but I actually don't want to get a job. I actually want to go through five years of not knowing where my next meet is going to come from, because I've got a dream. The minute you break away from society's rules, it'll do exactly what they do to you in prison. So check this out. So you break the law, they send you to prison. Why? Because if we can remove you from broader society, we punish you. Yeah? Human beings, by their very nature, need interaction. This is a vital part of being a human being. When you're in prison and you break the rules, what do they do then? They put you in isolation. So just to be clear, to the strongest, toughest, most evil people of society, the single most powerful form of punishing them is separation. It's not physical punishment. It's I'm going to put you in a hole, alone. That's it. And it will break you. That's why people don't have the courage to walk the path of entrepreneurship. Because the minute you're walking, you're going, holy shit, I'm alone. Rule number three, seize the moment. Leadership is about moments. And what makes great leaders is how they rise to the moment of leadership. You see, you can't lead until the moment actually arrives to lead. It's not built into the ether. It's the moment to lead that's important. The challenge with many of us is when that moment arrives, we question, we doubt, we obfuscate. We go, me? No, not me. What about so and so? Why don't they do it? Why don't they say it? Or worse, we make that terrible statement. It beckons often at the back of our heads. It's like a resounding, grazing, nasal chamber. Why me? Why you? Why not you? It's that old Tibetan saying, which was translated into English. If not you, who? If not now, when? The moment of leadership is critical. And what people often misunderstand is the moment of leadership often goes to the people who don't have the position and they don't have the power, but they exercise the influence. Rule number four, remove your ego. I'm gonna give you some advice somebody gave me when I was much younger, and it's probably the most valuable piece of advice I ever got. When you're building a brand, you can't afford to have an ego. You gotta do whatever it takes to build it. Yeah, you know, I'm gonna tell you guys who actually gave me that advice. True story, George Sombonos. Uh, George Sombonos uh, is passed now. He used to run a company called Chicken Licken. And uh, true story, I was, I was in the Johnny Walker. Johnny Walker had a prize that they used to give to successful entrepreneurs, right? And jo George is in the running to win the prize. And uh, I get to him, I'm like, this is, this is good, it's nice. And he's wearing this like old shoddy suit. And I'm looking at him going, are you as good as nice? It's good, it's good, it's good. <laughs> and I'm like, are you that guy? Because he didn't look, you know, he's, about, he's a short guy. I'm like, it doesn't look like him. So we end, up, we end up chatting. And true, two weeks later, I'm driving past a chicken licking on William Nickel. And I'm hungry. This was before I had a specialized eating plan, you know? So I, was, so, I was like, so I was like, let me pull in. So I pull into the chicken licking to buy some food. And I see this guy picking up papers outside the chicken licking. There's a bit of litter. And he's picking, and I'm like, that looks like George. I can't be George. Like this is the guy, he owns the franchise. He can't be picking up, and it was him. So I go through the drive-through. At the time I had a, it was my first car, Toyota Run X. 
So I finish buying. I go through the drive through and I pull up in the parking. And, I, and he remembered me. He's like, hi, George. He's like, yeah, Vusi, I remember you. I said, why are you picking up papers? He says, what do you mean? He was, he was genuinely puzzled. I'm like, why are you picking up papers? He says, no, because they are here. This is my shop. <laughs> And the papers, they need to be picked up, right? Because in my mind, I'm like, I would have come in and gone, Elon, Ela, Ewen. <laughs> There's papers, you know, that's what I would have done. Right? I, would have, <laughs> I, I wouldn't, you know. <laughs> but he's, he's looking, he's genuinely puzzled at me being puzzled that he's picking up papers. So I'm like, but you own this whole thing. And at the time, I think he had like 120 or 130 franchises. I'm like, you own this thing. Why would you pick up papers? And he said to me, when you're building a brand, you can't afford an ego. Yeah. He says, because the customer that drives past doesn't go, who picked up the papers? They just go, are the papers picked up, yes or no? Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there. Rule number five, learn from the past. I love my country, I do. But I think one of the things that holds us back as South Africans is we love to pretend the past didn't exist. In fact, it's a South African pastime. We're really good at this. We're really good at pretending our past is an imagination, a manufacture of people that are trying to push a certain political agenda. The reason we do this is because if we pretend for a moment it wasn't as bad as they say, or we pretend for a moment it wasn't as vast as they say, then we don't have to own the responsibility of what that past has brought into our present. Consider for a moment, if you will, your life today is nothing more than a manifestation of events in the past. Your perspective, your education, your history, your financial background, the decisions you're making, where you live, all of that is predetermined by the history of where we come from. Those of you here who are in South Africa because you come from Zimbabwe are probably here because of the most recent history of your own country. As a Zulu man, I know that I owe my lineage not only to the Zulu people, but also the Swazi people. That's my birthright. It is a split of my lineage. And even at a personal level, I own that I am in Gauteng because it is a migrant province. The history of how my grandfather, my great-grandfather first moved here. Moving from Swaziland and then moved into Mpumalanga, from Pumalanga into Alex, from Alex into Benoni. That history is predetermined by the fact that this province is a migrant province. I cannot stand here, 32 year old man, educate with a masters from the UK and say to you, well, I am just because I am. Rubbish, bullshit. I am because the history of the people who have brought me to the space I am in has predetermined where I am today. If you want to understand how you fix the future, you first need the courage to confront the past. Rule number six, innovate. When I was in school and I was studying innovation, we were taught about different types of innovation, right? So there's a breakthrough innovation, there's incremental innovation, there's a moonshot, there's a hack, a sandbox. Like we all know about innovation theory, right? But there's also an innovation that actually nobody tells you about. Do you know what it's called? Useless innovation. I'll give you an example. So I see banks in South Africa now having a pissing contest about who can take a car, which is traditionally rectangular, and in the horizontal and make it vertical. How is this an innovation? I'm really, really confused. Like, how is this an innovation? In a South African context where the majority of the population is either unbanked or underbanked, where the interest rate are prohibitively high for people to participate in the formal economic system, where the banking infrastructure allows or disallows a lot of people who live in rural and very urban areas access into the banking community, and when a majority of the people who live in South Africa have not, are not part of the formalized economy, instead of solving that problem, you guys are really worried about whether or not the card is vertical or horizontal. How about for the middle class, where many of the old traditional banks have different systems running different parts of the bank, and they don't talk to each other, so you can't have a single view of the organization. You guys are really worried about, is the card horizontal or vertical? 
I just want to say this to you, right? So watch now what's going to happen when there's this whole drive about, is it a vertical card? Is it a horizontal card? Is it, just watch what's going to happen. Everybody's going to jump up and down in a big contest about who can introduce a vertical card first. Banks, let me just share something with you as a client. Nobody cares. Like actually just nobody cares if your card is horizontal or vertical. We care if you give us access to financial services that are well priced, if you give the majority of the population access to the financial system, if you can diversify your product portfolio. That's the stuff that's important. Is the card vertical or horizontal? Give me a break. Rule number seven, become influential. I think we're in a moment where you and I are called to lead. Now, here's the thing about leadership, which I think most people misunderstand, is the assumption that leadership is based on a position and the presumption that leadership requires power. Neither of those are true. What leadership actually requires is influence. And no matter where you sit, whatever your vantage point, no matter how low or high in the mountain bed of opportunities, all of us have influence. How will you influence? That's the question I want to ask you right now. How will you influence? Let's draw some inspiration from sport. I'm a petrol head. Anything that burns petrol, I'm very passionate about. I race cars, I race in the V12 series. I'm very good, if I do say so myself. But the one sport I've never been able to get into is bike racing. A couple of reasons, but the most is, I just can't understand how you would go that fast in anything that doesn't have a seatbelt. Makes no sense to me. Many years ago, I was working on my first book, The Magna Carta of Exponentiality. And as part of the book, I got to interview motorbike racing drivers. I interviewed the top four in the world at the time. Mark Marquez, Valentino Rossi, Casey Stoner, and Jorge Lorenzo. And I asked each of them a very simple question. What makes you the best? You see, you've got to think about sports that are formulaic in their construct. That means all of us that compete in the game have exactly the same rules. Think, for instance, about Formula One. The reason it's called Formula One is because all the teams get given a formula. You can't just do what you want. So they tell you the size of car, weight of car, the composite materials you can use to build a car. They even tell you the type of tires your car can ride on. They'll tell you the size of the engine, this thing called a capacity or displacement, even the technology of the engine, naturally aspirated, turbocharged, or supercharged. The drivers in the cars, they generally get given a median, average weight, average height. So at the beginning of a season, when you see all the cars lined up on the track, recognize something. Everybody has the same inputs. It's the same formula. If this is true, and it is, then explain to me why Lewis Hamilton is arguably the greatest driver of our generation. Explain to me why Michael Schumacher was probably the greatest driver of all time. Explain to me why Senna is the most revered driver ever to grace the track. It's because there are some people where even though the construct and the rules are fixed, their influence is disproportionate. And that's what leadership is. It's about influence. Rule number eight, leave your legacy. Now what? Now what? Yeah, I feel like, um, so God's been good, right? And I, I, I say this to people all the time. I'm just the vessel doing the work. Now what? Mm. Like, okay, so where do I go now? What's next? What am, I, what am I trying to leave behind? So I'm very much at the now what part of my life, which is about legacy. It's when Vusi's not in the room, what's left? Because it's not, you know, it's not the Patek Philippe watches, it's not the cars we yeah. drive, it's not the places we live in, it's not the people we holiday with, the places we holiday. It's, yeah. it's more than that. And I'm, I'm trying to answer that question. You, so that your thing about brand, and I, I say this to my team all the time, which is even in the construct of brands, we must always recognize that we will never be the equal of the brand. And this is what many people who build brands get wrong. So particularly people who do personal branding. So uh -huh. they go, well, I'm a great ex, I'm a great comedian, a great singer, a great actress, a great whatever. So yeah. you become this brand thing, but you forget that a brand is something that lives in people's mind, which is, which is to say your existence becomes a manifestation of somebody else's expectation. 
Uh-huh. Now, most people are bad at the expectation part. So they think you're still in charge. You're not in charge anymore. This thing called a brand now outlives you. Like oh. you, It's a bit like building a Lego set. You just built the pieces. What people will do with this Lego set is up to you. And that's so kind, of, kind of how I think about my life. That is such a hard truth. It is, right? It is such a hard truth. And by the way, the most powerful brands are the ones that the people who construct don't own. When you cease ownership, Mm. that's when you've built a brand. Because it means that there's somebody on the other end who's gone, this thing is so powerful, Mm. not only do I want to be a part of it, I want to help build it. Mm -hmm. There is a, I think it was Friedrich Nietzsche that said that true true power finds expression in the absence of power. Which is to say, when I can give power away and still have power, I have power. Number nine, achieve excellence. I was explaining to my son that where I come from, We were taught to appreciate and understand that it wasn't the size of the home that was important. It was the condition in which that home was kept. And that the condition in which that home was kept was not a reflection of the economics of that home. The condition in which that home was kept was not a reflection of the economics of that home. It was a reflection of the quality and standard with which the people in that home held themselves. That even if you had one shirt, it was washed and ironed every day. That even if you're like me, you only had a single pair of school shoes, you polished it every day because the polish not only made it shine, but it protected it from wear and tear and gave it a longer life. That you knew, you know the smell of Mr. Mim. And Hendi Endi. You are still there, comrades. Excellence. Is not a concept foreign to us. Excellence is in our DNA. And so what's important for you and I is to remember this. Because where we come from, what we represent is far, far stronger than anything we have done. Before I love and leave you, let me end by saying this. I am of the view that the history has not yet been written. The stories have not yet been told. The fables have not yet been imagined, nor tales foretold about the capabilities of Africans. It's still not been written. Yours And my task and my generation is seized with making real a history that will be told about a new Africa. One that brought to the world innovation and one that held itself to a standard of excellence. And rule number 10, the last one before some very special bonus clips is be resilient. There are some things that you can't wish away. We're in the dead of winter right now. You could go on your knees, close your eyes, and look up to the beautiful South African skies and pray to whichever God you praise and ask that God that the temperature of the day should change. And it won't because the season is winter. And life is exactly the same. The seasons are presented as they are. If there must be feast, there will be famine. If there must be prosperity, there will be moments of poverty too. The difference is not which season we go through, but the difference is our consistency as we go through those seasons. And so the final note for you to think about as a young person today is to be consistent in your resilience. Because it's easy to be nice when things are good It's easy to be liked when you're not speaking the truth. Resilience, leadership, finding the moment, accelerating through those corners and being the pilot that's able to fly through the storm. All of those require the singularity of truth. So rethink for yourself what you stand for. Reframe for yourself what this moment is about and restart to yourself 
the contribution you'll make to society.